Boldwood presents The World Outside My Window Written by Claire Swatman and read by Antonia Beamish The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Prologue, March 1991 It was almost midnight, as it often was by the time I staggered out of the restaurant after a long shift. Rain had transformed the pavements and roads into slick, shimmering lakes. And as I pulled my car out of the tiny staff car park, I smiled. There was something special about London at this time of night. It felt as though the city had fallen into a deep slumber, and the roads were deathly quiet as I wound my way northwards towards East Finchley. Fifteen minutes later I turned onto my street. The rain had begun again in earnest and I squinted through the windscreen, the ancient wipers losing their battle against the sudden downpour as I searched fruitlessly for a parking space. I crawled past my flat and slowly down the street until finally I found a space a couple of hundred metres from my front door, just big enough to squeeze my little Fiat into. It felt like a small triumph. As I locked the doors, I felt a rumble of anxiety in the pit of my stomach. The sudden downpour had ended as quickly as it had begun, and while the pin-drop peace might seem magical from the safety of a car, there was a menacing undertone to a darkened London street, and I hurried my pace. Key wedged firmly between my fingers as a weapon, just in case. The moment my flat loomed into sight, the tension began to drop from my shoulders. Although my husband, Jim, was away, the hall light light I'd left on earlier still glowed like a welcoming beacon. I checked my watch, 12.24am. I'd be inside any second, stepping through the door into the safety of our flat. I hitched my bag up onto my shoulder and took a few more steps. It happened without warning. Staccato movements, beats of terror. A knock against my elbow, a hand on my mouth, a stifled scream a stumble, blinding pain. Primal, all-consuming panic. Fury rose in me as I tried to jab my elbow into my attacker's face, but his vice-like grip held me firm. Fury turned to terror as I was dragged towards a narrow pathway between two houses. I dug my heels in, frantic, desperate, but it was hopeless. He was stronger than me. I stood no chance. Then we were engulfed in blackness the street lights positioned so that no one passing the end of the alleyway would ever see us. A face loomed, tiny eyes in a black balaclava. Make a noise and I'll kill you, he hissed, his body pressed against me, and I realised I was trapped between him and the wall. I frantically dragged air in through my nostrils. In, two, three, four, out, Two, three, four, breathing was all I could concentrate on. He tugged at my waistband and I screamed, but no sound came out. Terror rose in me with every second. I couldn't let this happen, just yards from home. His hand moved inside my trousers and pulled hard. I heard a rip and tried to kick out, but he pushed my legs apart roughly. Then a glint in the darkness, and I froze, paralysed with dread. A knife. For a few seconds, we were both utterly still. Then, adrenaline kicked in, and I sucked in as much air as I could and tried to scream again. But a dizzying pain filled my head, my neck, my face. It smacked my head against the wall. I slumped down, all fight gone, as my body roared with pain. This was it. This was the end. A shout, then, and the eyes in the mask froze. Hands ripped away, footsteps receded. I was suddenly alone again, hunched on the cold, wet ground like a puppet whose strings had been cut. As quickly as it had begun, it was over. I stayed there, curled into a ball, for what could have been seconds or hours. Then, someone in the dark. Are you all right? And I knew I was saved. A man had been walking his dog, had heard noises from the alleyway. He'd given chase and called the police. My saviour. He helped me up, walked me home, and stayed with me until the police arrived. He made tea and spoke to the officers, 
and gave a brief description of the man who'd attacked me, for what it was worth. We all knew he'd never be caught. I stayed up for the rest of that night, too terrified to sleep. The police wanted me to go to the station and give a statement, but I refused. When Jim returned from work the following day, he begged me to go, but I still said no. Two weeks he stayed at home with me, desperately trying to get me to see the GP, the police, to consider returning to work. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't even contemplate crossing the threshold of the flat. Because something told me that if I just stayed in the safety of my own four walls, nothing bad could ever happen to me again. I haven't been outside since. Part One Lost Chapter One The 17th of September, 1992 Laura Parks hasn't left her home for more than 18 months. Neither has she spoken to another soul apart from her husband, Jim, and her best friend, Debbie, in all that time. She's only aware of the passing of the seasons thanks to occasional snapshots of the outside world through gauzy net curtains and slices of life glimpsed through narrow gaps between blinds. And now, Laura has been abandoned. At least, it's beginning to look that way. Because Jim hasn't come home. Here she is, hovering by the window, squinting into the cul-de-sac, making deals with herself. Perhaps, she reasons, if she stands here for ten more seconds, he'll appear. Ten seconds pass. Another thirty seconds, then... That should be enough. She feels her heart skitter inside her chest as she peers through the blinds, angling herself so that she won't miss her husband's familiar figure the second he rounds the corner, while avoiding revealing the whole street at once. Her gaze flicks to the clock above the fireplace and back again. He's now an hour late. He's never an hour late. She inches closer to the glass until her nose lightly touches one of the vinyl slats. Dust shoots up her nostrils, making her want to sneeze, and as she breathes out, the glass behind the blind mists, clears, then mists over again. It's getting darker now, spaces between the houses opposite rapidly turning grey, smudged with shadows. An early evening breeze tickles the treetops, making the leaves dance, and a few float to the ground, zigzagging through the air before brushing the earth with barely a murmur. It's peaceful outside now. Everyone finished with their lawn mowing, hedge cutting, car washing. Lights are being switched on in living rooms. Smoke rises from chimneys. There isn't even the usual bored teenager doing keepy uppies by the curb to disturb the peace. She starts suddenly, her pulse quick-stepping as a movement catches the corner of her eye by the next door's hedge. But when she looks more closely, it's gone. A fox, probably or next door's cat. She pulls back, angry with herself, and picks up a glass from the coffee table. There's less than an inch of clear liquid left in the bottom, so she tips it down her throat and stalks into the kitchen to top it up, the vodka splashing onto the worktop as she pours with shaking hands. She takes another gulp and closes her eyes, leaning against the counter for support, and listens to the drum of her pulse in her chest her temple, her limbs. She feels weak with worry. The sudden peal of the telephone breaks into her thoughts, and she almost screams with fright. Jim? Her voice fires out like a bullet, hope flaring in her chest as she smacks the plastic receiver against her ear, the twisted wire swinging forlornly. It's me. Her shoulders sag, stomach dropping with disappointment. Oh. Hi, Debs. Don't sound too pleased to hear from me. She hears her best friend swallow and pictures her sipping the cup of tea she always has on the go. There's a rumble of the TV in the background and she imagines Debbie's kids stretched across the carpet on their bellies watching Blue Peter or Pingu, their favourite. Sorry, I just... The words stick in her throat. Has something happened? The concern in Debbie's voice is clear now 
and she feels a stab of guilt that she always puts her best friend through so much worry when she has such a lot on her plate already. It's Jim, she croaks. He's missing. A second of silence, then, what do you mean, missing? A pulse beats in her temple, and she swallows. He's not home yet. Saying the words out loud make it feel all too real, and she starts to shake. Do you want me to come over? When Steve gets home, she hates that she's so needy, that Debbie even has to ask this question. She's 33 years old. She should be more than capable of looking after herself. But she's always had someone there as a crutch. Mum, Dad, before he disappeared like a wisp of smoke, Debbie, and for the last seven years, Jim. The thought of being alone makes her feel as though she's been hollowed out or lost a limb. No, it's fine. I'll be fine. You stay with the kids. She takes a sip of her vodka and realises the glass is already empty. Jim will be home soon. I'm just being silly. You're not being silly, darling. You never are. Laura can hear the concern in her friend's voice. But I do think you're right. I'm sure Jim will be home soon. Laura swallows down a sob at her kindness and whispers, Thank you. Don't be daft. Debbie goes quiet for a minute, but Laura knows she's still there. Will you let me know when he gets back? Of course I will. And Law? Yes. Try not to drink too much. Promise? Laura looks down at her empty glass, at the half-full bottle next to it, and replies, Guide's honour. When she replaces the handset, she stares at it for a while, willing it to ring. Just like when she was watching out of the window, she makes deals with herself. Maybe if she stares at it for 30 seconds, it will ring, and she'll hear Jim's voice, telling her everything is okay. A minute, two minutes. Eventually she gives up, and splashes some more vodka into her tumbler, knocking it back in one. She never used to be much of a drinker. Back when she met Jim, she only really drank when she went dancing with her friends, and even then she'd mainly stick to wine or the occasional gin and tonic. She wasn't a lonely drunk, stuck at home knocking back vodka night after night, passing out rather than falling asleep. But ever since the attack, she'd felt like a broken window, pieces of herself lying splintered and discarded on the ground, and as though booze is the only thing that can start to patch those pieces back together again however ragged and makeshift the repair job is. Who cares if it's a temporary solution, if it helps for a few moments? She snatches up the bottle, refills her glass, and takes them both out into the hallway. She hurries past the front door and runs up the stairs, stumbling as she reaches the top, almost spilling the drink from her glass. She takes the last few steps more carefully and heads into their bedroom. The curtains are drawn in here, the same as every other room, and it's dim, barely any light filtering through the heavy fabric. She slams the bottle and glass on her bedside table with a crack. A bath. She'll take a bath. Perhaps by the time she's run it, Jim will be home. She'll tell him how worried she was, and he'll laugh at her indulgently and say, Oh, law, you're such a worrywart. And she'll wonder why she ever felt this tense and panicked in the first place. She sticks the plug in and sets the taps running, tipping in bubble bath. As she waits for the bath to fill, she thinks about where Jim might be. It's Thursday, which means he usually gets home at 6.23pm. She knows this because she waits for him like an eager puppy every week and is overwhelmingly grateful the minute he walks through the door. Jim spends three, sometimes four days a week working away in Leeds, and when Laura was her old self, back when they first met, this wasn't a big deal. Yes, she missed him. Yes, she wished he weren't away so much. But she understood he loved his job, and she kept herself busy when he was away, seeing her friends and working longer hours to fill the time until he was back. When he was home, he was attentive and loving, which made the time apart bearable. Now, though, the days when she's alone, stretch on endlessly like a piece of elastic. 
the time between Jim leaving and returning, spent waiting, counting down the hours, the minutes, until he walks back through the door at 6.23pm on a Thursday evening. Debbie tells her it's no way to live, but her life has been this way for so long now, she has no idea if she's capable of doing anything about it, or even if she wants to. She turns off the taps, walks back into the bedroom to get her drink, then lowers herself into the scalding water. She ignores the scream of her skin as the water turns it from pale milk to fiery red, keeps going until her ears are submerged and she feels instantly cocooned, a sense of safety enveloping her as the steam spirals upwards and the tension slips away from her shoulders. The sounds of the house, the clunk of the central heating, the ticks and buzzes and hums of various domestic appliances, as well as the deadened thunk of her heart beating, are muffled through the steaming water, and she closes her eyes. Maybe when she opens them again, Jim will be standing there, smiling at her. She tests it by opening one eye slightly, but there's no one there, and her heart plummets to her stomach. The sense of terror that something terrible has happened to her husband is creeping closer, like a monster in a horror film. There are facts. One, Jim is never late. In fact, he prides himself on his timekeeping, and if he is going to be late, he will always let her know. Two, Jim knows how much she needs him, how much she relies on him coming home after three days away, and would never just leave her wandering. Three, Jim knows she's completely alone. She doesn't have any friends apart from Debbie, who lives 30 miles away with her family and can't just drop everything to come and see her. And she doesn't know any of the neighbours in the street they've lived in for the last seven months. Four. Something has happened to Jim. The certainty hits her like a hammer blow and she sits up suddenly, the water cascading off her body and splashing over the side of the enamel bath, soaking the peeling tiled floor. She stands and clambers out of the bath, wraps herself in a towel and pads wet-footed across the carpet, leaving a trail of damp Bigfoot prints across the landing and down the stairs. She needs to do something. She needs to find Jim. She can't function without him. She takes another gulp of her drink. Then she picks up the phone. Chapter 2 Then September 1985. For some people, the tireless pace of a kitchen was too much. But for me, usually shy and quiet and not keen on spending time with strangers, the adrenaline surge I experienced every time I stepped into the restaurant kitchen couldn't be beaten. Work consumed me, and I loved the rhythm of it, the chopping, the sizzling, the rush of heat as another dish was cooked to perfection. I felt so lucky to be head chef of a restaurant in the city centre at the age of just 26. It was the only place I felt fully in charge, and I ran a tight ship, but I didn't like interruptions because they ruined the flow. So when I heard someone calling me in the middle of a very busy service one night, I ignored them and assumed they'd give up and go away. But they didn't, and when I looked up again, there was a figure standing beside me, right by my elbow. I spun round, my face flushed and hot, ready to give them a dressing down, but I was stopped in my tracks by the sight of the handsome man standing beside me, smiling sheepishly. I felt the kitchen walls shift ever so slightly, and the light became a notch brighter as I took in his chiselled cheeks and long lashes. Oh, I said stupidly, my face flushing even more. I'm so sorry. He shuffled his feet as I worried how terrible my hair must look beneath my chef's hat. What a... could you... We both started to speak at the same time and laughed. Then he glanced up and smiled nervously. Seriously, would you mind putting that thing down? That was when I remembered I was holding a bloody great knife in front of me like a weapon. I dropped it onto the worktop with a clatter and his shoulders sagged in relief. That's better. When he smiled, his eyes twinkled. Eyes stuck out my chin, defiant. 
how can I help you? I kept my voice clipped, because his handsome face didn't detract from the fact that he'd stormed into my kitchen uninvited. I'm really sorry to barge in like this, I can see you're busy. It's just I wanted to give my compliments to the chef and they wouldn't let me come in, so I sort of sneaked in. Oh, I see. With those words, my anger fizzled out, and I noticed the anxious faces of my team watching me. I shrugged, trying for nonchalant. Well, you're here now, and good. I'm glad you enjoyed your meal. What did you have? The duck. It was exquisite. I smiled. Thank you. Unsure what else to say, I turned back to my chopping board and picked up my knife, but he was still hovering expectantly. I opened my mouth to ask him to leave. Would you like to come out for a drink when you've finished here? He blurted. Oh, I... I stopped, completely thrown. For a moment, I didn't recognize myself. I wasn't the sort of person who had men throwing themselves at me, asking me out on dates left, right and center. I felt the room tip as I tried to formulate a response. That would be lovely, I found myself saying before I'd even decided I was going to say it. But it won't be until at least eleven once I'm done here. My hand was shaking, and my voice wobbled, but he didn't seem to notice. That's okay, I'll wait. Well, if you're sure, then I'll see you later. Great. I'm Jim, by the way. Laura. See you soon, Laura. As he made his way back into the restaurant, I found a smile creeping onto my flaming face. I couldn't believe I'd agreed to a date with a man I'd never met before. Just like that. What was I doing? But there had been something about Jim that I'd liked the look of. Something kind, trustworthy about him. And I was right. Later that evening, he stayed behind for a drink after hours, and he was everything I'd hoped he would be, and more. We talked and talked. I found out he had a secret love of cheesy musicals, that he'd been close to his Aunt Bess, who had taught him to sew, although her death a few years ago had left him heartbroken, that he worked for a hotel chain, and that he hadn't believed in love at first sight until today. In return, I told him about my love of cheese and Marmite toasties with brown sauce. And you a chef, he'd said laughing. The fact that I'd always wanted to be a chef that I'd only ever kissed three boys, and that I did a great impression of Margaret Thatcher. I even found myself telling him that my dad had walked out when I was young, and that I missed my mum who lived with her boyfriend, Brian, who I couldn't stand, something I rarely talked about with anyone. I've never believed in love at first sight before, either, I added coyly. He held my gaze for a few seconds, and I felt my body flush with heat. Then his eyes flicked to the clock. God, I'm sorry, it's crazily late, he said, draining his whiskey and wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. He was tantalizingly close to me, and I could make out the dark chestnut of his eyes, flecked through with gold, searching my face. I studied him back, wondering what it was about this man that made me feel as though I'd known him for months, years even. When can I see you again? He said, twirling a piece of my hair with his finger. His voice was low, gruff, and I felt it in my bones. Tomorrow? I said. He hesitated just a fraction of a second, then closed the gap between us and planted a gentle kiss on my lips. My whole body buzzed. That sounds perfect. Then he stood and held out his hand. I'll make sure you get home safely. True to his word, he found me a taxi, paid my fare up front, and waved as we drove off, leaving him on the pavement all alone. And that was that. I finally believed in love at first sight. Chapter 3 Now The 17th to the 18th of September, 1992 the police don't care. Laura has told them Jim hasn't come home, but the young police officer on the other end of the phone dismissed her concerns before she'd even got to the end of her sentence. I'm sorry, but we don't class an adult as missing until they've been gone for at least 48 hours, he said. 
Yes, but... I'm sure he'll be home soon, Mrs. Parks, he said, cutting her off. Can I at least leave my details in case? She said quickly, twisting the phone cord round and round her fingers until they turned white. The officer sighed, and someone shouted in the background. As I said, Mrs. Fine, don't worry. She hung up before she started crying, but then the tears sprang immediately, uncontrollably. Now she doesn't know what to do with herself. It's only been two hours since Jim was expected home, which means there are almost two long days to get through before the police will listen to her, and even then it's doubtful they'll understand quite how worried she is. She's not sure how she can make them care. She walks over to the kitchen window again and peers through the blinds, twiddling with her sapphire wedding ring, which is now too loose on her finger. The street outside is as much a mystery to her as the Sahara Desert or the Himalayas. Insurmountable, distant, terrifying. It's peaceful now, the darkness fully drawn across the sky, and she watches the branches of the willow tree in the centre of the green dance in the what's-it orange light from the street lamp. An empty crisp packet skitters across the road, becoming lodged in the wall of number five, before finally escaping and continuing its journey. She wishes she could follow it. She knows it would be so simple to just open the front door, step outside, and walk across the road to knock on the tatty plastic door of number nine, introduce herself to the people who live there, and ask for their help. Her head knows there's nothing to be afraid of out there. And yet it feels like an impossible task. Since the attack, she hasn't been outside, not once. When they left London to move here, to this lovely little commuter town half an hour outside the city, she was heavily drugged, like some sort of cattle, and deposited in this house so that she never even knew she'd been outside. And even though it had been her idea, she'd been insistent that a change of scenery was what she needed, that getting away from the bustle of the city would help her to get over the attack. It quickly became apparent that she simply brought her anxiety with her, lock, stock and barrel. So that's why, since they arrived here seven months before, she hasn't left the house, not even to go out into the garden, which mocks her every day as the weeds grow taller and the flowers bloom and die. Jim's home for half the week, and when he's here she feels as though maybe things aren't so bad after all. It matters less that she's unable to do anything for herself, because Jim does it for her. He does the food shopping, and doesn't even object to buying the vodka and wine she asks for every week. He cleans, he cooks, he pays the bills. Plus, it's Jim who's made a home for himself here. It's Jim who has got to know the neighbours. I hate the thought of you being here all by yourself. I wish you'd come with me to meet some of them, he said one day just before he was due to leave for another four days of work. I can't, Jim. You know that. Maybe I could invite someone round then, make a night of it. No. He bit his lip and turned his head away. Laura knew he found it frustrating, but she couldn't help it. Every time she got anywhere near the door, visions of those eyes peering out from the black balaclava flashed before her, and she couldn't take another step. The thought of someone she barely knew coming into the house was almost as bad. So she's stuck here all day alone, with only the occasional visit from Debbie, not exactly Jim's greatest fan, to break the monotony. How has her life become so infinitesimal? Now, as the daylight fades and shadows deepen in the corners of the room, everything makes her jump. Simon from across the road putting the bins out, his wife pulling into her driveway and slamming the car door, a cat dashing out from behind next door's front wall and knocking over a garden gnome. Everything makes her heart race. And now Jim isn't home when he's meant to be, and she has no idea what to do. In the end, she drinks, the same as she always does. She knows she really needs to eat something, but cooking has been another thing that she hasn't been able to face doing much of recently. She misses it. 
Cooking has always been a part of her for as long as she can remember. When things were tough, whenever she felt sad or insecure, she cooked. The slice of a knife, the smell of roasting garlic, the sizzle of a steak. They were all things she could lose herself in whenever she felt down. But now, she can hardly even bring herself to open a tin of beans or turn on the oven for a frozen lasagna. It all just feels too much. Jim has been understanding, of course, the way he always is. But the ready meals and baked potatoes he rustles up after a long day at the office are a huge come-down from the sorts of meals she loved to cook. Fragrant curries, wild mushroom risottos, grilled sea bass, duck confit, the smells of the spices filling every corner of the house. Those things seem a million miles away from her now, and it makes her feel as though she's lost a part of herself. She opens the bread bin and pulls out a half-eaten loaf of mighty white and checks a slice for mould. It looks fine, so she sticks it in the toaster and waits. When it's cooked, she spreads a thin layer of butter on it, grabs her vodka bottle and heads to bed. If she can just fall asleep, maybe things will look brighter tomorrow. Maybe Jim will be home. For a few seconds after she wakes up, she's forgotten everything that happened yesterday. In fact, the main feeling is of a pounding headache and a nauseous feeling in her stomach, which momentarily overrides everything else. Her eyelids are stuck down, and when she peels them open, the light pouring round the edges of the curtains is so bright she has to close them again and hold her palms over her eyes while the blotches subside. She rolls over onto her side and fumbles on the bedside table, trying to find a glass of water, something to quench her raging thirst. But instead, her hand hits something cold and hard, and the crash it makes as it hits the carpet wakes her up with a start. She peers over the edge of the bed and sees the vodka bottle she brought up with her last night rolling around on the floor. It's empty. Ugh. She stays still a moment longer, waiting for her head to settle, then rolls onto her back and stares up at the ceiling, trying to put her thoughts into some sort of coherent order. She drank most of a bottle of vodka last night. Debbie would be furious if she knew. Jim won't be too happy either. Jim! The memory of the previous evening hits her then, and she pulls herself up to sitting, ignoring the spinning room, instead listening for any noises that might indicate that Jim finally came home while she was passed out, or that last night was, in fact, nothing more than a terrible nightmare. She strains her ears, listening to the sounds of this shabby house, familiar now, after seven months. The clunk of the boiler as it fires up, the drip of the broken tap in the bathroom, a low hum from next door's hoover, she hasn't even met the woman who stands just a few feet away from her on the other side of this wall, and yet she hears her daily movements all the time. What an odd existence. As the realisation hits that she's still alone, her stomach drops. She needs to get out of bed and do something, try and work out what's happened to her husband. She swings her legs out of bed and shuffles across the carpet, concentrating on not throwing up. As she switches on the bathroom light, she catches sight of herself in the mirror above the sink and groans. Her skin is almost translucent, hardly surprising, as it hasn't seen the sun for more than 18 months, and the dark circles under her eyes are black, like bruises. She turns away, not wanting to see the reality of what she's done to herself, her gaunt cheeks, her haunted look. She hovers over the loo for a few minutes to make sure she's not going to be sick. Then pulls on a fresh pair of jeans. They hang off her now, so she loops a belt through them. And an old jumper and heads back down to the kitchen. Through the fug of her hangover, she has the idea that she needs to try to formulate some kind of plan to find Jim. On autopilot, she fills the kettle with water, spoons Nescafe into a mug, then takes the phone off the hook and drags it over to the kitchen table, stretching the coil of plastic until it strains to get back on its base. She grabs the notepad from yesterday, where the number for the local police station is scribbled, and redials it. She knows they're not going to do anything, but she needs to feel as though she's doing something. My husband is still missing, 
she blurts as soon as someone answers, even though she has no idea whether it's the same prepubescent officer she spoke to the previous evening. I'm sorry, madam. Can you tell me who's missing, please? says a female voice. And so Laura repeats her story about Jim not coming home last night, about how she rang and was told he hadn't been missing for long enough, but that she's worried about him. I see. A silence. And you say he's been missing for how long? She glances at the clock on the cooker, whose green digits tell her it's 8.36 a.m. Fourteen hours, as far as I know, but it could be longer. It's definitely been more than that since I spoke to him. I see, she says again. And Laura feels fury unfurl in her like a weed, stretching its leaves to the edges of her patience, before the officer has even had the chance to dismiss her. You don't understand, Laura yells, her voice cracking as she leaps up, the wooden chair toppling over behind her and clattering to the floor. He's never late. He's always home on time. And he would never just not turn up. He... Her voice breaks. She was going to say that Jim knows she can't cope on her own, but she realises, before she does, how pathetic it sounds, and also how little difference it will make to anything the police do anyway. I totally understand, Mrs. Parks, she supplies. I totally understand what you're saying, Mrs. Parks, and I understand why you might be worried. But the trouble is, you see, that we're not allowed to investigate missing adults for at least 48 hours following their disappearance. Yes, I know that, but... The thing is, Mrs. Parks, the chances are extremely high that your husband simply stayed out for the night and forgot to let you know. Grown men tend to come home sooner rather than later, and we simply don't have the resources. Laura has heard enough, and she races across the kitchen and slams the phone down before the officer has even finished her sentence. Well, screw them if they don't want to help. But she knows her Jim, and she knows he would never abandon her after she's been on her own for almost four days straight if something terrible hadn't happened to him. Her hands shake as she pours her coffee, taking care not to let the water splash across the worktop. The fridge reveals the milk has gone off, so she tops it up with cold water and a spoonful of lumpy coffee mate, which turns it a weird grey colour. She knows she should probably eat some food to soak up the vodka in her bloodstream, but she feels sick to her stomach, and certain anything she eats will curdle instantly. Instead, she picks up the fallen chair, sits back down at the kitchen table, and studies the stripes of sunlight that have been painted across the tabletop by the morning sun squeezing its way through the gaps in the half-closed blinds. She clearly needs a better plan than relying on the police. She pulls the notepad towards her, turns to a new page, then picks up a half-chewed pencil from a nearby pot and jots at the top of the page, Finding Jim. She stares at the words for a while, the letters bleeding into each other, and tries to think this through logically. It doesn't matter that she knows Jim would never just up and leave her on her own. She needs to work out what might have happened to him and what she's going to do about it, all without leaving the house. Work, she scribbles underneath. Jim works in Leeds for half the week, and has done since long before they were married. He's some sort of director, she believes, although when she really thinks about it, she's never actually checked, which is odd, of a large international chain of hotels, and shortly after they moved in together, he started working up north for half his working week, she didn't mind, not really, and even though she missed him when he was away, given the intensity of their relationship at first, it did at least mean she had time to see other people, do other things. She asked if he could go with him once or twice, but he put her off, assuring her she'd be bored as he worked such long hours. She notes down a couple of names she's heard him mention and puts a question mark by their names. Chris and Dev. Dead? Hurt? She's aware this could cover any number of things, including someone hurting him and him falling ill. But as she doesn't want to think about it too much, she just makes a note to call some of the hospitals in Leeds and London, and moves on. Friends, family. 
The trouble with this, she realises instantly, is that she doesn't really know how to get hold of Jim's friends and family. He doesn't have any immediate family, and his friends all seem to be connected to his job, which means she hasn't met them either. How has she allowed this to happen? She draws a giant question mark next to this section and decides to come back to it later, if need be. She ponders her list. It doesn't seem like much, and yet it's all she has. She's always known that she'd need to try and overcome her agoraphobia sooner or later. But since the attack, Jim has always been there for her, being the front man in their marriage and blunting the edges of any glaringly obvious gaps in her social abilities. Without him, she's lost. Chapter 4 Then October 1985 The candlelight flickered between us as Jim studied the menu. It's always hard finding somewhere decent to take a chef, he said, running his finger slowly down the steak list. But I've been here before, and the food is pretty good. He gave a goofy grin. Not as good as yours, obviously. It looks lovely, I agreed, even though I was trying to ignore the overinflated prices. This wasn't the sort of place I normally came to, and I couldn't help feeling a little self-conscious, not least because everyone in here... Jim included, was at least ten years older than me. I'm just grateful to eat something I haven't had to cook myself. Well, good. The waiter appeared at our table, and Jim put his menu down. We'll both have the steak, rare, and a bottle of the Pinot Noir, he said. Oh, I... I started, but Jim flashed me a smile. Trust me, the steak is the best thing in here. Okay, I agreed handing my menu back. He studied me in the dim light. His eyes shone, and I noticed the fine lines radiating out from them, the hint of grey at his temples, the only obvious sign of the fourteen years between us. He was so handsome, and so much more loving and attentive than men my own age. Not that I'd had much experience. I'd only ever had two boyfriends before, and they had never been as exciting and intense as this. This was what romance should look like. This was how real men did it. It had only been two weeks since Jim had burst into my kitchen and into my life. Since then, we'd seen each other most days, and each time had felt more extraordinary than the one before. You barely know him, Debbie had said, when I'd told her I thought I was falling in love. But I feel as though we've known each other for years, I'd admitted, knowing I was failing to explain the true depths of my feelings for this man. She had frowned, as I'd known she would. Laura, what's going on? This isn't you. This isn't how you behave. What do you mean? My voice had been sharp, and Debbie had noticed. She'd sighed. I mean, she'd shrugged. Nothing, I guess. I just think you should be careful. You've gone this long without giving your life up for a man, and I just worry that you've gone a bit gaga for this Jim. Gaga? I thought you'd be happy for me, I said, more than a little grumpily. I am. I will be, she'd said. I just think you're taking it a bit too fast. What's the hurry? How long were you with Steve before you got married? I'd said, challenging. You're thinking of marrying this guy? No, but you're missing my point. You and Steve weren't together very long before you became serious. I just don't understand why you've got such a problem with me doing the same. She'd hesitated then and studied the tabletop, where our almost empty glasses of wine sat in puddles of water. Then she'd looked up at me with concern in her eyes. Because this is so out of character, Law. I've always thrown myself into relationships full pelt, you know that. But you, you don't. You're careful, more cautious. And this is... She'd stopped again, frowned. I just want you to be careful, that's all. Promise me you will be. I'd softened and decided not to cause an argument. Debbie was my oldest friend, and she was only looking out for me. Besides, our other friends had arrived then and the moment had gone. 
promise, I'd agreed, as the others had sat down. We hadn't said another word on the subject for the rest of the evening, or, in fact, since that night, a few days before. But now, as I sat opposite this man, who'd turned my world upside down in just two short weeks, I felt a nugget of resentment at Debbie for not being more supportive, for trying to spoil what otherwise felt so amazing, so new, so thrilling. The waiter arrived with the wine, and Jim and I chatted easily. Even though we hadn't known each other long, it felt easy, natural between us. We were on our second bottle of wine, and our steak plates had been cleared away, when Jim reached across the table and took my hands. A spark ripped through me at his touch, the way it always did, and his gaze was intense, as though he was searching right into my soul. I've got something to tell you, he said, licking his lips nervously. And it affects us. What is it? What's wrong? I said. I felt dizzy with worry. You know I work for a hotel chain. I nodded. He looked down at the table briefly, then back up to meet my gaze. They want me to start working in Leeds a few days a week. Oh. I hated the thought of him being away so often. But it was such early days between us, I didn't have the right to feel upset about it. But he hadn't finished. I watched his shoulders rise and fall as he took a deep breath. Laura, I know we've only known each other a couple of weeks, but honestly, I feel as though I've known you for years, and I hate the thought of us being apart when I'm home, in London. I... He met my gaze now. I want to be with you. All the time. I stared at him, trying to read his eyes, my heart skittering around like a balloon in the wind. What are you saying? I want us to move in together. Was he being serious? Debbie's words jolted through my mind as I considered what he was saying, her warning for me to be careful, not to do anything out of character. But then I thought about the time I'd spent with Jim, how much fun we had, how happy he made me feel, how safe and secure in such a short space of time and I knew I didn't want to give that up. I... I hesitated, watching the shadows dance across his face, highlighting the curve of his cheekbones. I know it's really soon. I don't expect you to give me an answer straight away, but I've never felt like this about anyone before, and I just want to spend as much time as I can with you. He looked back down at his hands on the tablecloth, and my heart surged with love. Love? Already, I heard Debbie's voice whisper in my ear, but I pushed her away. She didn't understand what it was like when Jim and I were together. This was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. Yes, I said, my voice hoarse. I coughed and said it again, louder, as Jim looked up at me, his eyes wide. Yes, I'd love to move in with you. Really? Do you mean it? His voice was high, excited, and I loved that I made him feel that way. I do, Jim. I agree it's soon, but I also agree it feels right. I shrugged. I say, bugger it. Let's do it. Oh my God, Laura, I can't believe this. His grip on my fingers tightened, and I smiled as happiness flooded through me. So this was what it felt like to be utterly adored. I knew now that I'd never felt it before, and it felt amazing. Two weeks later, Jim and I got the keys to our own flat. I'd given a month's notice on the flat I shared with virtual strangers in Kentish Town. Jim had done the same on his soulless flat in Hammersmith, and we'd pooled our resources to rent a gorgeous two-bedroom flat in a street of Victorian terraces in East Finchley. It wasn't an area I knew well, but Jim had been keen. This is a million miles better than my old place, Jim said as we lugged the last of the boxes up the stairs. Definitely better than mine too, I laughed as I almost dropped my box of books in the hallway. The minute I'd seen this apartment, I knew it was perfect. The high ceilings, 
the small fireplaces in each room, the wide, expansive windows looking out onto the street. I could instantly see myself making this place feel like home, and judging from the number of boxes I'd already moved in, it wouldn't take long to fill it up with all the things I loved. Jim, on the other hand, had barely anything, and I couldn't help wondering where all his stuff was. The one time I'd stayed over at his flat, it had felt cold and impersonal, almost clinical. The walls painted magnolia, the prints on the wall, generic scenes of boats and fields and cottages, and barely anything personal anywhere. Where are all your things? I'd asked. He'd shrugged. I'm not here a lot. I don't have much, he'd said. But it's so impersonal, I'd replied, running my finger along the mantelpiece, which had been empty apart from a single framed black and white photo of a couple. I'd picked the photo up, but before I could ask Jim anything about it, he'd plucked it from my hands and put it back where it had come from. Sorry, he'd said. I don't like anyone touching that photo. It's the only one I have of my mum and dad together before they died, and, well, I can't risk anything happening to it. Oh, sorry. I'd felt chastened. No, I'm the one who's sorry, Lola, he'd said almost instantly, using the new nickname he'd decided suited me better than Laura. Of course, you're welcome to touch whatever you like in this flat. After all, you're not just anyone, are you? I'd been about to ask him what had happened to his parents, realising it was odd that there was still so much I didn't know about him when we were moving in together, but he'd changed the subject, and I hadn't found the right time since. I wasn't worried. We had plenty of time to get to know each other. Now we were going to be living together. Right, shall we christen the bed? Jim said grinning like a naughty schoolboy the minute the door closed behind us. And before I could say another word, or tell him I wanted to unpack, or do anything else at all, he'd dragged me into our brand new bedroom and made love to me there and then on a mattress covered in nothing but a single sheet. Chapter 5 Now The 18th to the 19th of September, 1992 just before five o'clock, Laura's doorbell rings. Normally this would be enough to send her running for the safety of her bedroom, but today is different, because today Debbie has come to help her. She scurries to the door, closes her eyes while she opens it, and lets her best friend enter. It's not until the door is closed again and Laura is wrapped in a hug that she dares open her eyes and start to relax. Oh, darling girl, Debbie says. She's a good few inches taller than Laura, and Laura finds it comforting to feel the press of her friend's cheek on top of her head. They stand there for a few seconds, before Debbie pulls away. Come on, let's get away from this door. One of the things Laura loves best about Debbie is how she always knows exactly what she needs. They've known each other since secondary school, and while other friends came and went, Laura and Debbie always stayed strong, solid. They were together through the teenage years when Debbie was off snogging boys while Laura stood shyly on the sidelines, and Debbie was Laura's cheerleader when she got her first job as a chef. Debbie is, and always has been, the only person Laura's ever told all her secrets to. The fact that Debbie isn't Jim's greatest fan is the only fly in the ointment, and one that's become harder to ignore over the years. I just think he tries to control you too much, was all Debbie would say on the matter when Laura asked her why she didn't like her husband, and she's never wavered in her opinion, which is why Laura is worried what Debbie is going to make of Jim going missing now. They head straight to the kitchen at the back of the house, where Debbie unpacks the milk and tea bags she's brought with her, flicks the kettle on, and opens the cupboards searching for cups. It irks Laura more than it should, that her best friend doesn't know where anything is in her kitchen anymore. It shows how little she's seen her best friend in recent months, and it's entirely her fault. Have you eaten? Debbie says, as they sit down at the dining table with their drinks. Not really. Oh, Law, you've got to look after yourself. She peers at her, eyes narrowed, 
and Laura is acutely aware of how terrible she looks. Have you been drinking? No. Debbie narrows her eyes. Last night, Laura hangs her head. Yeah, she admits. Sorry. Debbie's fingers press against her forearm. Don't be sorry. I just worry about you. Debbie stands, opens the fridge, and places a just-in-date yoghurt and a Kit Kat on the table. Eat this, and I'll make us something proper to eat in a bit. She sits down opposite Laura. Now, tell me what's going on. Laura peels the paper wrapper off the Kit Kat and runs her thumbnail down the foil, snapping the chocolate in half. She takes a bite and chews slowly, then looks up at Debbie's concerned face. I'm so scared something's happened to him. Her voice is wobbly, and she coughs, takes another bite of her Kit Kat, the sugary chocolate giving her a head rush on an empty stomach. Her hands are shaking, and she wraps them around her cup to warm them. The light in the kitchen at this time of the evening is dim with the blinds closed, and dust dances in the tiny stripes of light that slip between the cracks. I've rung all the hospitals in and around Leeds, and a few in London, Laura says eventually. I've spoken to the police, but they're not interested. She stops, aware of how sad it sounds that that's the extent of her detective work. I just, I don't really know how to get a hold of Jim's friends since we moved. I don't even know where his address book is. They used to have a book with all the phone numbers of friends and family on the table in the hallway in their flat in London, but she doesn't remember having seen it since they moved here, and she's only just noticed. Debbie breathes out slowly, her forehead creased by a frown. You do remember that Jim's got form, though, don't you, Law? Laura's heart drops. Debbie's right. This isn't the first time Jim has disappeared, although last time he was home within 48 hours and distraught about worrying her, having been called away on urgent business without access to a phone. How could she have forgotten? I know she says, her voice hoarse. I just... this feels different. He knows... she stops. Debbie knows what she's saying. She might not be keen on Jim or even quite understand why Laura loves him so much, but even she understands that Jim would never just up and leave her when she's so vulnerable. I know, darling, Debbie says. I'm sorry, you're right. This is different. Things are different. She drops her gaze to the list on the table between them, suddenly thoughtful. What are you most scared about, Law? She says, eventually. That something terrible has happened to him, or that he's left you by choice? Laura listens to the silence in the room, to Debbie's gentle breathing, to the drumming of her heel on the floor as her leg jiggles up and down. I don't think he's left me, she says quietly. I don't think he'd do that, would he? No, I don't think he would either. But what's the alternative? Laura's breath hitches. I, I can't stop thinking about him lying in a ditch somewhere. I keep wondering whether he's been attacked or hit by a car or been beaten up. She trails off. And I hate myself for thinking... That would be a better alternative than him leaving me deliberately. There's the truth, she could admit only to Debbie, that it would hurt her more to lose Jim by choice than accident. Debbie nods in understanding. Well, the good news is that he's not in hospital, at least not anywhere obvious, she says. Have you rung his office? Laura shakes her head. I couldn't remember anything about the company he works for she admits, ashamed. I don't know anything about his life outside these four walls anymore. I'm a terrible wife. No wonder he's left me. Don't be daft, Debbie says. Anyway, it's a bit too late in the day to be worrying about tracking down his office now. She stands, tying her unruly blonde hair into a high ponytail efficiently. I know you don't feel hungry, but you need to eat. I'll cook dinner and then we're going to come up with a plan. Okay. 
Laura feels as if she might cry and swipes her hand across her face. Our help. For the next 20 minutes, they stand in companionable silence, boiling water, opening tins of tomatoes, peeling and chopping some past their best onions they find in the back of the cupboard, and rustle up a plate of pasta and tomato sauce. It's not until the food hits Laura's stomach that she realises how hungry she is. She wolfs the pasta down, hardly pausing for breath, then clatters her fork against her plate. Debbie is barely halfway through hers, and she looks up at her knowingly. I think the first thing we need to do is get some food in that fridge, she says, sucking up a piece of spaghetti and slopping sauce on her chin. She wipes it away with a piece of kitchen roll. I know. Jim usually does it. Debbie takes another mouthful. Do you want some of mine? I had a huge lunch, so I'm not that hungry. Laura shakes her head. I think there might be some ice cream in the freezer, though. She stands. What she really wants right now is to open a bottle of wine, drink the whole thing down, and pass out in bed again, oblivious. But she knows what Debbie would have to say about that. So instead, she busies.